Well, for the second night in a row, the Predators win 2-1. to one, And for the second night in a row, they do everything they can to try to lose the game. But a goaltender steps up big for the Predators again. We'll talk about last night's win over the Blue Jackets today on the Locked on Predators podcast. Your Locked on Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Predators your first listen of the day. Every single day, we are your free daily Nashville Predators podcast that's available to you wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. I'm Nick Morgan. I'm a writer and editor on the forecheck.com, and I have a partner in crime. You do. I am Ann Kimmel. I'm a writer and editor at insidethepreds.com. Uh, this show is not a rerun. No. But it might feel like it because the Nashville Predators, it kind of felt like the same game as the night before. Yeah. A little Groundhog Day ish, mm-hmm. if you will. Although. When asked about it in in post game media, John Hines was clear to point out that no, actually this one was a little bit worse. <laughs> but yeah, ultimately, just replace moments here and there, and and you've got a repeat. Yeah, it's like what the Preds go up two nothing, and Blue Jackets come back in the third, and almost you know probably should have scored at the very end, and Lankinen comes up huge, and yes. It feels like it's just like a giant powwow of everything we talked about from the Calgary game. Yeah. The night before. Substitute Lankanen anytime that we said Soros, and then you would have a very similar game recap. Very similar game recap. We should have just done that. Like have like one of those like blue jackets. Yeah. Like and just have it like oh paste it over anytime we said flames yesterday. I think we could have gotten away with it. I yeah, think we, we probably could have. Could have. Uh, we'll keep that in the back pocket for some other time. Yeah. Uh, so like we said, Predators win the game a 2-1. They just didn't at times look like they deserved to win the game. Cody Glass and Yakov Trenin scored in the second period. Blue Jackets pushed hard in the third period. Got one back thanks to Gustav Nyquist's goal. But then Kevin Lincoln in uh, maybe his best goaltending performance of the season shuts them down at the very end, including 12 shots on Blue Jackets power plays. 12 shots on Blue Jackets power plays all last night, and he stopped every single one. Uh, Definitely the MVP of the night. Mm -hmm. And what is your one word to describe last night's game? My one word to describe last night's game is this game we used to play. No, I'm just kidding. I was going to say perfection again. <laughs> this time you could go like Operation or Operation Mousetrap. Or, Mousetrap or any of those games. This was actually a really hard game to come up with a, a one word for because there was something very sedate about this whole evening in Bridgestone Arena. So that is actually my one word, similar to my one word. My one word is decaffeinated. This was a a decaffeinated game. This was a little bit of a decaffeinated evening at Bridgestone Arena. Both teams coming in off of back-to-backs. Columbus um, played Monday night against the New York Rangers, lost that game three to one. The Predators came off a game against Calgary. So both teams, you could tell this was a second game of a back-to-back. And I think that Nashville, and and a a lot of teams, but I think specifically Nashville after coming off of the road trip and going right into these back-to-back games and Saturday having Buffalo at home, like I think this team is really ready for for a little bit of an all-star break, some recovery time. But this was a game that was very decaffeinated from both teams. Like there, there wasn't a ton of like really dynamic play, unless you're talking about Kevin Lankinen, who we're going to touch on his performance a little bit later. But it was just a very decaffeinated version of, of a hockey game. You know, I don't think that either team exhibited the best speed and breakaways and rush chances. 
that they can generate. I don't think either team probably played the best defensive game that they can generate. I don't think, well, I know, friends, that at least one team did not execute on special teams their power play like they can do. So this was just a very decaffeinated game. And even in Bridgestone Arena, it was not super full. And so somebody was commenting to me like, wow, I don't know that I've ever seen it, you know, kind of this empty even on a weekday game. But you have to remember, this was a rescheduled game Mm -hmm. from, this was a water main game, wasn't it? This was one of the two water main games and the other is Colorado. Yeah, so this was a water main game. So you have people that were planning on coming to this game over a, a break that now have to try to fit it in on a Tuesday evening. So I think that eliminated some of the crowd that could come. And then I don't, you know, if you are listening from outside of Nashville, let me give you a little hint. Nashville traffic is a hot Hmm. mess. And there were a couple of accidents coming up to Bridgestone Arena that had 65 North shut down. And so there were people tweeting online, like hoping to get to Bridgestone for the second period. So it just was this very sedate, very decaffeinated evening of hockey at Bridgestone Arena last night. Like, I just, I can't even come up with anything with any more zhuzh. It was decaffeinated. Yeah, it it feels like when you're describing, yeah, it was just neither team executed. One team probably should have because the other one is in contention for Connor Bedard at the moment. So it (laughs) feels like there's, I feel like there's a little bit more damning of a talk about one of those teams than the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, Anne, I'm just gonna go ahead and steal a concept from yesterday. Remember, yesterday my one word was like check engine light. Yes, where it's like you're kind of ignoring the car. My one word for today is beater. <laughs> you guys know what a beater car is, right? Yeah. It's like the car. It's like the little like chipped white sedan. Like one of their car doors is red because they had to replace a car door from like a, a different car. It like looks on its last legs and it gets you from point A to point B, but it might explode at any moment. Mm-hmm. And you probably shouldn't be driving it. You should probably get a new car. But hey, it's getting you from point A to point B. And that kind of feels like the Predators right now. They're winning games, and mm-hmm. like they're they're winning games, like they're getting their. I mean, two game winning streak, four points in two two nights is pretty good, nice. uh, especially when you're in the playoff race and you have some ground to make up. It's just not like a great way of getting those two points, you know. Yes. Like nothing, nothing about the way the Preds played the last two nights. It's like, yeah, that's a that's the team that's turning the corner. Like mm-hmm. this is this is the play that we need if we need to make the playoffs. They're getting wins, which is good. Like you you can feel good about a win in any situation, especially down the stretch. Sure. But the the play and how you get there is kind of a wild ride. You know, it's just like riding in the car of the beater. Like it's like any it, the minute you like try to go like over 60 miles an hour, you can hear like the <laughs> engine just screaming at you. Yeah, it's like loud noises. The muffler doesn't work. It feels like the bottom might fall out at any moment. And the Preds play the past week or so. It kind of feels like that. It kind of feels like this entire thing could just either blow up in flames or just collapse at any single moment. And that kind of feels like the ride we're on right now. It's like, look, we got we got the win. We got from Mm -hmm. point A to point B. That's that's good. That's one thing. How we got there, the vehicle in which we got to point B, it desperately needs to be looked at or changed or else this is just going to epically collapse. Yeah, and I struggle with that with this team right now, especially because you look, like you said, you look at these two wins and and there's nothing super attractive necessarily about these two wins separate from goaltender performance. Um, Other than that, you know, you're going to dig a little deeper to find some more highlights. You're going to dig a little bit deeper. But I I also struggle with, like you say, you know, if these four points get us to the playoffs eventually, 
it becomes like that question I, you know, if my kids are, are struggling with a decision, you know, kind of my baseline question is when you're 80 years old, is this decision going to be something you're going to look back on and you're going to go, yep, that's, that was one of those ones that I sh went A and I should have gone B. Or when you're 80 years old, are you going to go, I don't remember what I was like, I don't even remember anything about that situation. The problem with the Nashville Predators right now is I don't know which one we are. Like, is this the team where they're going to get to the playoffs and they're going to go, yeah, I don't even really remember that stretch where the pen or where the power play was so bad. I wish we could defer or, you know, they're just not going to remember that. Cause you know what? Look, Hey, we're in the playoffs and we're looking ahead and things, you know, we've turned things around and we're where we need to be. Or is this the team that's going to go? Yep. You remember when we should have gone A and we went B. Remember when we won those four points? But looking back, we were like, oh, those are the red flags we should have paid attention to. Like, I don't know where this team is yet. How are we in mid-January, Nick, and not really get this team? I mean, I'm guessing it all become very clear in the first round of the playoffs if we make it if we make it if we get swept again i'm sure it'll be clear then but like really can you say yes this is this is a this is a playoff team no or can you say this is a team that's desperately in need of a rebuild yes you the answer so? is the answer to both of those questions <laughs> is yes and yeah, I, yeah. I, I just, I don't, I don't know what's happening, Nick. <laughs> join, join the club. I mean, it, it feels like every Predators game that we watch is just a crapshoot at this point. Yeah, like uh, here we are. Plenty to talk about from this game still, uh, including another really bad night for the power play. And John Hines uh, has weighed in with the fear of God everybody uh you'll want to hear his response to when ann asked about the power play last night first though want to mention today's show is brought to you by bet online betonline.net is your number one source for sports betting info stats news and analysis you can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there everything from the nfl playoffs to college basketball to the nba nhl european soccer golf tennis rugby cricket whatever you name the sport they've got it at betonline.net and if you love sports podcasts like this one you can find those at bet online as well they're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fixed so head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about all the action happening today bet online where the game starts <clears throat> all right and um it was another bad night from the Predators power play. No, we talked the other night. We talked last night after the Calgary game um, about that one power play at the end that looked like a Flames power play. Not like the Flames had some shorthanded chances. As in the Flames were setting up plays in the Predators zone with a man down. Like yes. that's how bad the power play was. You you hope that was maybe just like a one time really bad power play. Boy, it, it, felt like, it felt like every power play last night from the Preds uh, kind of resulted in that same sort of dear God, who has the main advantage right now kind of yeah. mentality. Yeah, it became penalties became that moment where you're like, if only this were like football and we could decline. Yeah. Like, that's kind of where we were at. And so uh, Nashville, I think, had three power play opportunities in the game. And after the game, and again, just not much generated. They generated three shots on their six minutes of power play time, three shots on net. Um, and that has to be equal to or less than probably the number of shots that the Columbus Blue Jackets had on the penalty kill in those six minutes. So after the game, asked John Hines, hey, what did you see on the power play tonight? And John Hines wanted to let us know exactly what he saw on the power play. This is what he had to say. 
Yeah, the power play tonight was 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 not good at all. I thought that uh, we tried to force plays on entries. Our execution was not very good when we put pucks in, and you had to because they stacked the line. I thought our intensity level in the puck battles wasn't close to what it needed to be. I thought when we got pucks on our sticks in the power play, we turned it over. Um, you know, tonight I would say that it was uh, it wasn't it wasn't good in any area. He's not wrong. <laughs> He's not wrong. He's not wrong. It was rough. It was the power play has been rough. And this is one of the things that's very frustrating about this team right now is that we can look back a couple weeks where the power play was executing so well. Yeah. You know, and, and it was contributing to significantly higher scoring wins over better teams, you know. But Nashville could not get anything right to last night on the power play. I mean, they couldn't enter the zone. I do want to give a shout out to Tommy Novak, who appears to be the only one bold enough to try to just skate it in because most everybody else is like, mm, there's guys there. Yeah. Maybe no, maybe no. Or again, like Heinz said, they got to a point where, where Columbus kind of stacked the blue line and the Predators would dump the puck in. Well, that's okay. You can do that. But you must chase the puck after you dump it in. And you must come out away from the boards with the puck. And they did not. Kevin Lankin and probably handled the puck more on the power play than any other of the National Predators players when they were on the ice for the man advantage. And it's definitely something that I got the feeling from John Hines that they're going to be working on because it, you just are not going to win games down the stretch. You know, Matthias Ekholm said after a game a couple weeks ago, you know, our power play has been what has helped us win some games. You know, when we were successful last season, it was because we were getting power play goals. You are not going to make it to the playoffs unless you take advantage of the man advantage. And Nashville last night was absolutely awful on the power play i mean awful on the power play i want to get your take on this and mm -hmm. so the predators last season had one of the best power play units in the nhl and it was like i think it wound up being like 90 percent of the production nine out of ten power play goals happened from that first unit yes which was roman yossi running point Ryan Johansson, Mikhail Granlund, Philip Forsberg, Matt Duchesne. Mm -hmm. That was like the unit. We've seen John Hines, you know, try to get some younger players involved. Guys like, you know, Phil Tomasino, Yuso Parsonen, Cody Glass mm -hmm. over the last two years. And they've tried to kind of mix in those people. And, um, you know, whenever it does, and this year, Tommy Novak. Yes. Whenever they've whenever they've done that over the past two years, it just doesn't seem to work mm -hmm. for whatever reason. But it's a double edged sword because you want those players. Ellie Tolvanen, too, when, you know, he was on that second power play unit a lot last year that wasn't doing anything. Right. You know, obviously, that was like one of the big reasons the Preds parted ways with Tolvanen is because they didn't feel like he was getting any power play time. Does it feel like, you know, obviously you want to reward these young players. You want to put them in situations where they're getting some good opportunities with the man advantage. But, Anne, do you go back and just have to kind of run with that OG core at this point? Because it's like, I get it. It's like, it's a double-edged sword because some of these players are not getting you know, maybe the power play time that they need to grow and develop. But at the same time, you're losing some valuable chances with the mm -hmm. man advantage. And I'm wondering, it's like, you know, do you go and say, look, we need to score on the power play. We need to win some of these games. We have to just put that one marquee unit out there together. And then, you know, we can find a way with some of these younger remaining players, maybe to put something together on that second unit. I can definitely see the logic of it, but here's the part that I think makes that a struggle is that some of those players, those OG power play guys from last year are not performing well right now. 
Matt Duchesne, and you know, you know that that is hard for me to say, but Matt Duchesne and Mikhail Granlund are not playing well right now. Fair, yes. Um, offensively, their offensive game is just not there. And so I almost, I understand what you're saying, like get back to what did work and then add in these extra pieces. But I don't know that that even is going to fix it because I think some of those OG people are not going to perform well on the power play because I think they're still struggling to get to their game at five on five. Like I think Philip Forsberg on the power play like that Roman Yossi on the power play like that. I feel like they're getting away from net front presence on the power play. And I thought this just as a general thing over, over the whole game last night, I feel like they are back to perimeter play and they're back to that one more pass to get that wide open net. And I, you know what? I like pretty hockey, but I love hockey wins and I don't care how they come. So get people on the power play and at five on five, get people back in front of the net, put the puck on the net. And I feel like they're so far away from that in these last couple of games that that is the basics they need to get back to. Because I think if you're talking about, about getting back to the personnel basics, I'm not sure that OG personnel are executing well enough to fix this power play right now. You know, and and I hate to say that. That's a very fair assessment. Yeah. And I feel like that maybe is a underlying thing of the bulk of the Predators problems right now is a lot of these people who were really good last year Mm -hmm. are struggling this year in a lot of areas where they were really good last year. And I feel Mm -hmm. like that's, that brings up an entire different conversation. Um, It's, I get it. And it's, it's a, it's a hard conversation to have because on one hand you know you put some of those original guys together maybe that's what gets them going true you know, maybe Mikhail Granlin has more familiarity with where Roman Yossi is going to be you know with you know when Philip Forsberg is going to make his break to the net when Matt Duchesne uh, is going to go you know front to make that shot like maybe there's more familiarity there and that's what gets their game going mm-hmm. um, it's 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 frustrating because you can see the Preds just trapped between eras right now. You know, Mm -hmm. they have all these young players that, you know, you need to give them a chance uh, to kind of, you know, be free and see if they can kind of handle the load. And we've seen that, you know, Cody glass scored a goal on the first line last night, made some really good plays. We've seen Yuso Parson and Tommy Novak uh, in big, uh, areas Mm -hmm. of responsibility this season and they've both done really well in it um but it's you know it's it's weird because it's like some parts of their game where they need to be in order to kind of grow and improve they're not able to get that because you have guys like Granlin and Johansson and Duchesne that are kind of the big guns that are you know making it very difficult for them to move up and down the lineup so you know, it's interesting. It's like the Preds, and you know, that's the entire reason, you know, Ellie Tolvanen unfortunately left and Phil Tomasino is in the minors right now mm-hmm. is because there just isn't space for them to get some of those chances. And that's why the Predators are going to be at a crossroads coming up here soon. Yeah. And I think the the power play is a microcosm of exactly what you're talking about. You know, do you invest the time in getting these, you know, kind of backbone players going, or do you say, look, it's just not clicking with these backbone of this team players. Do we need to just bring in and invest in these younger? I don't know what the answer is. I know what the predators are doing now, especially when it comes to the power play, that is not going to do it. You know, the predators are not going to make the playoffs. They are not going to be a competitive team if they don't get things fixed, especially on the power play. But yeah, I think there's a larger conversation. I think the Predators are definitely at a crossroads. Which way they will go, I don't know. I mean, what do we really know about this team? Stay tuned, everybody. Stay tuned. We're going to figure it out. Yeah. There were two really good performances that we want to highlight. Kevin Lankinen and young Cody Glass. 
both have great performances. So we're going to talk about those performances here in just a minute. Want to let you know that tomorrow we have kind of an interesting conversation, an interesting show we want to have. There was an article that came out recently from Money Puck about some of David Poyle's worst contracts. I have a real beef with number 12. I have a real beef with a lot of them. Yeah. So Nick and I are going to take a look tomorrow at some of these contracts and whether we agree with the assessment in this article. And of course, we will preview the St. Louis game. The Preds are going to take on the Blues tomorrow night as well. So all of that is going to be coming up tomorrow. But we still want to wrap up last night's game. Mm -hmm. And two players that I think do deserve a shout out from a pretty decaffeinated beater game are goaltender Kevin Lankinen and young Cody Glass. And here's what I want to say about Kevin Lankinen. I have been wrong in my life a couple of times. (laughs) I don't know that I know it's hard to wrap your mind around that, but um, I don't know that I have ever been as hockey wrong as I was about Kevin Lankinen. I was so hockey wrong. I am just sitting here right now in my hockey wrongness, knowing and repenting that I ever was aghast that the Predator signed Kevin Lincoln. And so Kevin Lincoln in fat apologies every time your name comes up on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he is, you're, this is like your husband's version of Matt Duchesne. This is a hundred percent. Yeah, where it's like, it feels <laughs> like you're just getting more embarrassed by your wrongness by the day. Hey, I was- Every day. I was wrong about Kevin Lincoln in too. I thought it was the dumbest signing of the summer. Um, and give credit to Kevin Lankinen because we're at the stage in which UC Saros is probably going to get the bulk of the starts down the stretch. Mm-hmm. And Kevin Lankinen, you know, his, his ice time is going to keep going down. But you're going to, as a backup goalie, you got to, especially when you're backing up somebody like UC Saros, you've got to stay fresh and find a way to stay dialed in and keep some game to game momentum going for yourself. Mm -hmm. Even if some of the starts might be two, three weeks apart at this point, you know, depending on, you know, how many back to backs the predators have, or, you know, maybe he gets like one start just to kind of break it up a little bit. But, you know, if the Preds are in the postseason, UC Saros is going to get the bulk of the starts. So for Kevin Lankinen to come in as a backup, not like a one B, like some of these other goaltenders, but as a, like a genuine backup and to play as well as he's played uh, this season. I mean, the guy right now is 924 save percentage. That's one of the best numbers in the entire league. And that's coming from a backup, you know, to to play that well and to give the Preds that kind of level of insurance and goal. That's impressive. That's really impressive for a backup goaltender Because you're doing it without kind of that start-to-start momentum. Yes. Well, and you look at last night's start. This was the first time Kevin Lankinen has been in a game since January 6th. Last week, we know he was going to start the second game at a back-to-back, but was out due to illness. We saw a scare-off come in. This was, I mean, this is a long break in between game speed, game time action. And Kevin Lankinen walked in that net he just sashayed himself into that net and was like okay let's go (laughs) and he was tested i mean the beginning of the third period it was like one of those moments right away where columbus got just quick shots just quick shot rebound shot right on net and kevin lankinen was so dialed in i i have to say and again you know i don't like to admit i'm wrong but what a difference a solid backup can make. And if there is a team that understands the value of a quality backup, it is the Nashville Predators after last season when UC Saros went out. And there's no shade, like no shade here. You know we love David Riddick and you know I would give a kidney to Connor Ingram without asking any questions. Love those guys. But you need somebody like Kevin Lincoln in to step in if something were to happen to UC Soros. We know what this team, we know what happens when you don't have that. So you hate to see a game where, again, a goaltender kind of wins it for the Predators. But hallelujah, the Predators have two guys that are doing that right now. Yeah. Throwback to the Pecorine days. 
Yeah. Uh, where it's just the bail and the Preds out left and right. Uh, so, hey, there's the old school Preds mentality there. Yeah. Uh, the other person I want to mention, Ann, is, is Cody Glass. And we talked about him a little bit in the last segment. But, you know, this is this is just a guy that you meant, you kind of said it yesterday. Eventually, we're just going to stop talking about him whenever he does something. Because mm-hmm. it's just going to kind of going to be the normal thing. Uh, right. Should have scored a goal against Calgary. Yes. Like that puck went off of him. Like let's. I'm, yeah. I just can't believe it didn't. Yeah. I mean, DNA. it's, it's got to have gone off of him. DNA. Test yeah. that puck. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a thick goal with five C's. <laughs> a thick boy goal. <laughs> Uh, but he scored an actual goal last night. And uh, yeah, so he now has four or three points in four games since being promoted to that top line. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, this is what you like to see from a young player like Cody Glass. And what's impressive to me, Ann, is he's kind of finding his all around game. You know, he, he's doing some stuff on the score sheet, but as a play facilitator, he's been mm-hmm. pretty good. Uh, And defensively, he's starting to work on that. Like the Predators, uh, according to the analytics, I don't know how it was last night, but in in Calgary, they absolutely dominated puck possession whenever Glass was on the ice. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much to like about his game. And look, my heart just goes out to Cody Glass because this is a, a young, incredible player drafted in the first round, a franchise's first ever pick you know, drafted with Nick Suzuki and drafted, you know, around Kale McCarr and all of these names. And I am telling you, this young man's road to the NHL has been so challenging, you know, from injuries to trade, to not quite ready, to relegated back to the AHL. This is somebody who has walked the hard road. He has done this the hard way. And what we're seeing now, I just could not be more delighted to see success from him. And, you know, even the beginning of this season was really challenging. He was a healthy scratch for a while. And that was something that a lot of Predators fans, I don't think I need to remind you, took, you know, great exception to. But he's now playing with a ton of confidence. He's playing on a line with Philip Forsberg and with Matt Duchesne. And at the Calgary game, my husband and I had this moment of, I, the, the jersey sort of tucked into the back of the shorts. Is that Philip Forsberg or is that Cody Glass? I can't tell. Is that an eight or a nine? That's how Cody Glass is playing right now. I need to yeah. see the number on your jersey because you look a little Philip Forsbergy to me and I can't always tell you two apart. That's where Cody Glass is. So after the game last night, we got a chance to talk to Cody Glass, who, again, like you mentioned, scored a goal. And so I got to ask him, what is different, not about his on-ice preparation, but what is a little bit different about where he's at mentally right now in the season? And this is what he had to say about that. I think just kind of being more loose. I think that's a big thing. I think I was kind of stressed out at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, in training camp, I had a bunch of cameras around me. And then, you know, going, being scratched, that kind of stuff. Um, I was just putting a lot of pressure on myself. And the guys have done a really good job talking to me and kind of making me feel at ease. So it's been really nice having just a good group around me that really helped me um, kind of find my game. And if I can just be more consistent and help this team win, it's it's a goal for me. You heard it here, folk. Here, folks. We are responsible for Cody Glass's new form. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that is the big takeaway from that bite. Uh, no, I mean you're you're right, Ann, and and he's right. Where mm-hmm. he talked about a lot of the pressure he was under before the season. Last season when he came up, it was kind of an afterthought almost. You know, it was mm-hmm. just like, wow, Cody Glass is very noticeable in a good way since he's come back in the lineup. But there really wasn't that like expectation. This year there was that expectation. Yeah, you know, he was expected to. I mean, Eric Dene wrote a really good article at the end of the season where it's like, yeah, he's in the NHL now. He's no longer an AHL player. Right. Um, And uh, he, so there was a lot of pressure on him. I mean, as you mentioned, like he was the centerpiece of that Ryan Ellis trade. Like Mm -hmm. the Preds kind of expected him to be one of their centerpieces. And when he got in and he's, you know, either on the fourth line or going in and out or, being pulled from that top six role after two shifts, 
you know, there was a lot of, okay, what's going on here? There's a lot of that Heinz discourse again, but he's really settled in. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's been very noticeable is he looks a lot, regardless of what role he's playing, um, he looks a lot more dialed in, like a lot more like he's playing with a little bit more conviction. Mm -hmm. He's more Uh, comfortable, I think, wherever they put him. Like, it's almost like they're... You know, he talked about he just the pressure is off and, and what pressure he was under. I mean, he was still I mean, he's been in the league a couple of years and he's still waiting for that opportunity to say, look, I am an NHL player. And finally, that pressure is off of him. And you look at what he is able to do in any situation. He just looks like a different player, I think, not even skill set wise, but just he looks like he's going with the flow of the game. He's in the game. He is where his skates are. He's not overthinking it. He's not second guessing. And I know that a lot of people will disagree with what I'm about to say. And I know a lot of people feel like the added pressure on Cody Glass came from John Hines making these terrible lineup decisions to healthy scratch him. I know that people are going to say that. And I know that the Ellie Tolvanen situation feeds into that. But is there a chance that the success that we're seeing with Cody Glass could mean that he got what he needed to be able to long-term be ready? Could it be that John, could it just maybe be that John Hines does perhaps know what a young player might need to be long-term successful with this team. Just throwing it out there. I'm going to use a Donna Mossism. I'm going to throw that out on the stoop and see what the cat licks up. I mean, he would have had some good confidence too, if he would have just stayed in a role the entire season and been like, yep, you're here. Do you, if he was playing in a way where the pressure that he was putting on himself was was inhibiting the game he can play on the ice. You think it's better for him to just hey just muscle through? I'm not allowed to say that. Just muscle through that challenge. Sorry about that. Um, or do you think maybe he needed to step back, clear his mind, keep doing the work away from the crowd, away from the cameras, to get that confidence back, and then come back in? depends on who you are as a person some people need that long leash where they're like i'm not gonna get pulled unless i just really suck mm-hmm. you know some people maybe maybe that helps cody glass is to have that mindset i don't know like it's different from player to player i agree i'm just saying it's like you know and, and again it's kind of ties back into the conversation where it seems like the preds are, are trapped between eras and some of these young players like Glass or Rest His Soul, Ellie Tolvanen, needed that longer leash to kind of see where they're at. And they weren't getting it because the lineup in front of them were so log jammed with veterans. Um, oh. there's, go- there's going to be a point, and, and, you know, barring a miracle Stanley Cup run, it seems like the dam has got to break at some point. When you look at all these people that are in the Pred system and you right. kind of look at where the Preds have been um, in terms of, I guess, discourse with getting out of the first round every single year, mm-hmm. it feels like the dam is going to break. And it feels like the Preds are going to have to sooner or later – change who's who's the centerpiece of this team maybe you can't do that with some of these contracts on the team but you're going to come to a point in which look these young players are going to have to kind of keep being shuffled in while we keep the band together or you're going to need to make some changes and that's a different conversation for a different day but it feels like that dam is about to break at any moment now I would agree with you. I think there is there is a definite crossroads ahead for the Nashville Predators, and it is coming sooner rather than later. Like yep. this, you can't kick this can down the road much longer. No, not at all.
Um, yeah, there was a lot to uh, unpack from that 2-1 win over the Columbus Blue Jackets that didn't really seem like much of a, uh, a talker game. No. Uh, but, hey, that's, uh, that's what you get from this year's Nashville Predators. Who knows what can you can expect. Uh, again, tomorrow, interesting conversation about David Poyle's worst contract signings ever based on an article with Money Puck. Spoiler alert, I'm going to disagree with the number one contract on that list. And that's something that a lot of people with, thought was the slam dunk number one. Um, that's So that's a conversation coming up tomorrow. Uh, until we get there, Anne, where can people find your work? You can find my work online at insidethepreds.com. And you can find me on Twitter at Anne K underscore Mama on Ice. You can find me at ontheforecheck.com. Follow me on Twitter at underscore NS Morgan. And while you're there, be sure to follow the podcast as well, LO underscore Predators. However you're listening to us, whether you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform like Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, whatever, or you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll always know when we have new content out for you. That's going to do it for today's Locked on Predators podcast. Thank you for making us your first first listen of the day. We'll be back tomorrow with an all new episode. We'll see you then.